I want to talk to you a little bit about symmetry. And this is objective GCOA3. Now in the actual objective, it doesn't use the word symmetry at all. But it refers to the motions in the plane that carry a shape onto itself. Now that is symmetry. So this really is referring to line symmetry or reflectional symmetry, rotational symmetry, and maybe point symmetry. Point symmetry is really a subset of rotational symmetry, so I think this is about line and rotational symmetry. So I guess let me give you a little backstory on this a particular objective for me. Symmetry, initially when I came to that objective, it spoke about the quadrilateral and the, in particular the parallelogram family. And I thought, this is an easy objective. They've handled it in earlier years. I'll just slide it down. When I handle uh, quadrilaterals, I'll handle some symmetry. Well, I got down there and I taught a little bit. It wasn't an emphasis, wasn't really important, and off I went. Well, I, I came around a year later and I realized that when I got to quadrilaterals, I was quite weak in what I could use to establish some of the properties of those shapes. And that had I taught symmetry, uh, symmetry earlier, I could have maybe used some of its power to help establish some of those properties. Let me give you an example of that. We learned that uh, a parallelogram has a rotational order of two. And that means it has a rotational angle of 180 degrees. So think about the things we typically prove about a parallelogram. Opposite angles equal, uh, opposite sides are equal, diagonals bisect each other, and so on. Those actually can all be established using our friend symmetry. Watch this. If you know that this has an order of two, it's guaranteed that this angle will map onto the other angle. That's what symmetry means. It's also true that this side here would map to its opposite side in a rotation of 180 degrees because we know that that order produced a mapping onto itself. We would also know that the diagonals had to bisect each other because this diagonal in the symmetry of 180 degrees, it would map onto itself. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. I started to see how knowing the line and rotational symmetries of our shapes allowed us to begin to establish truth kind of inside of it. So that year went much better. And so a year came around to now. I'm in the classroom a day or two ago again speaking about symmetry. And I put this up here and I saw an isosceles triangle and I said there is one line of symmetry. We've established that. We reflected onto itself. Everybody knew there was one. And I said but what does that mean? So instead of just teaching kids to draw lines of symmetry, to come up with the correct order and think that we got that objective handled, we didn't. Until they understand what I found out the other day when I said, what do we know? And they said, well, we know that AB equals BC. Why? The symmetry mapped it onto itself. Then we said the base angle here had to equal this one. They told me that this piece had to equal this piece. They told me that M became a midpoint. They told me that this angle here, A, B, N, and C, B, N, had to be equal because of the, the mapping, the symmetry onto itself. They told me that that was an angle bisector of angle A, B, C, they eventually told me more down here and then established that that was a perpendicular bisector, all because of one line of symmetry. That we learn that in one line of symmetry, the shape is cut in half and it creates pairs of congruences in all throughout that shape. And the more lines of symmetry, the more pairings of truth and congruence you would get. 
wonderful stuff. Let me talk about another very cool idea that's found in symmetry. This rectangle would reflect this angle to here using this line of symmetry. This line of symmetry would reflect this to here. Now that's fairly obvious. Four equal angles, opposite angles are equal, diagonals would be congruent, uh, or opposite sides would be equal, lots of things. But let me teach you a little hidden beautiful thing. This has an order of two, rotational symmetry. It has uh, also two lines of symmetry. There's a special connection between those. Let's see if you can catch it. Later, you and I will talk about double reflections over intersecting lines. So if two lines intersect and you double reflect, we learn you get a rotation. Well, we have intersecting lines and we can do a double reflection or two lines of symmetry and the lines intersect at 90. So a double reflection over a 90 degree intersection is a rotation of 180 degrees. The fact that there are two perpendicular lines there, it forces the rotation of 180 to exist. That's also true in all even orders, actually. Four, six, eight, all of those would also produce a 180 degree rotation as a part of the symmetries in that group. The square I have up here for one reason. It has four equal angles, four equal sides, and so it has four lines of symmetry and four rotational order. All things are equal. So, of course, you get the maximum symmetries. As soon as you alter the shape just slightly, like this one, if I take this one and I stretch those two sides out a little bit, I drop symmetry immediately because no longer do I have four things to pair but just two sets of two and so on. So, it's a very powerful idea. Don't let symmetry sneak by without digging into the idea that symmetry teaches us about congruency and pairing within the shape. It isn't just about drawing a line and, and determining an order. It's about the guts and properties of shape.